welcome everybody. Um, you know, as you, usually we have the chief residents do our introduction, but because of our uh, special inaugural um, Dr. Barbara T. Murphy Grand Rounds today, um, I have a special introduction by our division chief, Dr. John He. Thank you, David. So good morning. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the first annual Barbara T. Murphy Memorial Lectures. This is a very special occasion for all of us to honor Barbara's memory. Even though most of us know Barbara very well, I'd like to still spend a few minutes remembering Barbara and what she means to all of us. So Barbara attended a medical school at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and completed internship, residency, and clinical nephrology training at the Bowman Hospital in Dublin. Barbara decided to pursue further training in the United States, where she completed a transplant immunology fellowship in the laboratory of immunogenetics and the transportation at Brigham Women Hospital in Boston. Barbara was recruited to be the director of the transplant nephrology program at Monsana in 1997, where she built one of the most robust transplant nephrology program in the country. In 2004, she was appointed chief of the division nephrology at Monsana. And during the next eight years under her leadership, division experienced a rapid expansion in its clinical service training program and the research funding. As a fact in the division, we all benefited from her leadership and the mentorship. Barbara was promoted to the chair of the Department of Medicine in 2012. Only one year later, Mansana underwent a massive expansion after merging with another large health system. Barbara was instrumental in integrating the clinical and the training program for several large hospitals and became chair of medicine for the combined department of medicine for the Mansana Health System, where she supervised more than 2,000 faculties. I still remember how busy she was going back and forth between different hospitals during this day of the hospital merge. As an international renowned, renowned academician, Barbara served as president of the American Society of Transplantation and was president elect of the American Society of Nephrology in 2021, just before she passed away. Barbara received numerous honorary awards and a doctor degrees from academic institutions and a variety of society, including the inaugural American Society of Nephrology Trail Blazer Award for her extraordinary contribution to patient care, research, and education. As a scientist, Barbara was an international leader in the field of genomic science, genomic research. Her groundbreaking research used the high throughput genomic technologies to understand the immunomechanism that lead to allograft injury and the loss. A set of 13 genes was published in the Lancet in 2016 that could be used to identify kidney transplant recipient at the risk of allograft loss before the development of irreversible injuries. In addition, Barbara's library took a system biology approach to identify genetic factors that promote kidney fibrosis she described a gene called SHRM3, which plays a major role in kidney fibrosis. Barbara was so enthusiastic about SHRM3 gene, gene, and I was talking about SHRM3 each time when we met. But the Manning, her mentee, has continued to carry on this project with two active NHR1 now. Under her leadership, two companies were also formed at Monsana to develop AI-based diagnostic tools to impose CKD detection, management, and treatment. Barbara was also a great mentor. Numerous trainees from her laboratory went on to become funded investigator and assumed the leadership position around the world. Moreover, during her time as a chief of nephrology and a chief of a chair of medicine, Barbara was unwavering in her support of the hundreds of faculty, fellows, and the residents, including myself, who benefit from her leadership and the guidance. 
Barbara's brilliant professional achievement were remarkable. However, for those who had the great fortune to know her or to work with her, it was not these achievements that made Barbara so special and beloved. She was a nurturing mentor who prioritized personal happiness and well-being of trainees and the faculty in addition to their professional goals. Barbara is a generous, humble person with loyal and a loyal friend with a lot of human humors. We will remember forever. So now in her memory, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the first annual Barbara Murphy Lecture, Dr. Sun Quaggan. Dr. Quaggan is a graduate of the University of Toronto, where she completed her residency and served as chief medical resident for the universities of San Marco hospitals. She completed her nephrology fellowship at the University of Toronto and the Yale University, where she also completed research as, and postdoc training. Dr. Quaggan's research focuses on fundamental process needed to establish and maintain the integrity of the specialized vascular bed in the kidney and eye to understand and identify new therapeutic targets. She worked to develop genetic mouse model that allow cell and time specific manipulation of functional genes. Translation of a group's finding regarding the vasculature reveals pathogenic mechanism and the new therapeutic targets for a number of disease, including diabetic kidney disease, eye disease, nephrotic syndrome, and the glaucoma. She has published numerous papers in high impact journals, such as New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, and the Cell. Currently, she's a Charles Horse Horris Mayo Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University, where she served as the chief of the division of follows and her pension, and the director of the Feinberg Cardiovascular and the Renal Research Institute. Dr. Quaggan was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2019 and the National Academy of Inventors in 2021. And currently, she's president of the American Society of Nephrology and the counselor of the Association of American Physicians. Dr. Quaggan exemplified the very best of academic nephrology and was also a dear friend of Barbara. So Sue, thank you for joining us today to honor the memory of our dear friend, Barbara. And on behalf of the Department of Medicine of Mount Sinai, I'd like to present you a plaque. I, I have a plaque with me and, uh, and uh, I cannot give it today, but uh, we're going to mail it to you. So in the plaque, it said that the first annual Barbara Murphy Memorial Lecture, lectureship in extraordinary leadership present to Susan Quaggan. So now please join me to welcome Dr. Quaggan to give us a lecture on from potassium protocide to policy, the amazing journey of a physician scientist. Welcome Sue, thank you. Oh. Well, <clears throat> good morning, everyone, and Dr. He, thank you uh, so much for the generous introduction. And most of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, such a privilege uh, to be asked to join you um, in, in memory of um, Dr. Barbara Murphy, um, such a phenomenal leader, colleague, and friend. I know to so many, to everyone who's joining in today, um, as well as, as personally to me. So when I was thinking about what I would uh, talk about today, you know, I thought back to the first time that I actually met Barbara. And Barbara and I met many decades ago at a kidney week. Um, which uh, these are the formal photographs. And I think it's very fortunate that, you know, it was the time before there were iPhones that we actually first met in an Irish pub and there's no remaining evidence um, of that meeting, but we had an incredible time. And I think it was very evident even then when we were both very early in our careers that Dr. Murphy was exceptional. 
And we all know that she grew far beyond a triple threat, whether it's quintuple, sextuple, um, as physician, educator, scientist, mentor to so many, administrator, leader. And as Dr. He mentioned, uh, those were only her work-related roles. So I thought I would share today uh, with you a few vignettes, um, thinking back about my own journey as a physician scientist, as I think Barbara embodies uh, and embodied the very, very best of what we can all aspire to. These are my disclosures. Uh, they're not relevant for today's uh, discussion. So I'm going to begin uh, today by introducing you to one of my heroes and the reason that I pursued medicine in the first place. Um, this is a family physician from Toronto. I met him when I was 15 years old. And this photograph was taken from the national newspaper on the occasion of his retirement. And he was always known as Doc to his children, and he was known as Doc Smith to his patients and also to his neighbors. And Doc retired at the age of uh, 86. And at that time, he was still making house calls, often on his bicycle. And when he retired, he decided to pen uh, some stories. And he wrote a book uh, entitled House Calls. And um, it was uh, about his 67 years in practice in Toronto. And I'm going to share one of those stories with you uh, today. The story begins in 1937. Doc is uh, a young school age child and he recalls being held, uh, he recalls that this was during the polio epidemic in Toronto. At that time, Toronto had a population of half a million individuals and it was a particularly devastating year with 3,000 cases of polio. Children who would develop GI symptoms and a fever and paralysis and death and parents were uh, incredibly uh, terrified. And Doc recalls being kept up at his grandmother's cottage north of Toronto out of school until the cold winter months arrived when, when the risk of contracting polio was reduced. Now, Doc's father before him and his grandfather were both physicians, family physicians, and he also recalls his father often sleeping over at the hospital for fear of bringing polio home. Fast forward to 1950, there have been waves of polio in Toronto over those times. Doc is now in medical school and he recalls being assigned his scholarly project in the Department of Nutrition and he arrives and there is an experienced a uh, professor writing on the board uh, soup and the goal of their project was to develop a media or a soup of ingredients so they could grow the polio vaccine in a petri dish because at that point the only way to study polio was to import rhesus monkeys from india at very great cost Fast forward four years later, Doc is now an intern and he's doing his infectious disease rotation at the Hospital for Sick Children, another really bad year for polio in the city of Toronto. And Doc recalls losing three of his varsity swim teammates to polio, who he describes as incredibly healthy young men. And he recalls a particular day uh, on the infectious disease service when two 13-year-old girls who had both contracted polio in the same public swimming pool were admitted. One girl died very quickly. The other girl uh, remained alive in an iron lung that had been brought in from Boston to the hospital for sick children. And Doc's most vivid memory of this 13-year-old girl uh, is of her mother standing on the street below, looking up to her room seven, seven stories up with a mirror placed over the girl's uh, face so that she can see her mother standing below. Doc recalls this mother standing for hours on end, um, just motionless. The girl died a few days later. Now fast forward to the following year and physician scientist Jonas Salk um, has discovered uh, the vaccine for polio virus. And we now know that polio, although there are some pockets remaining in emerging countries, is largely eradicated. We move on to the 1980s in this story. Doc is now a seasoned 
a family physician. He runs the University Health Service. And he meets a mother who brings her daughter in for a well um, checkup, for a prevention checkup. And the mother does not want her daughter to be vaccinated against polio or vaccinated at all. Doc, um, if you don't know him, he talks quite a lot and he spends a lot of time with his patients. He spent a lot of time trying to convince her. The mother, well-educated, says she understands the risks and benefits, um, but couldn't be swayed. Doc, uh, frustrated, asked her to return the following day with her husband. She does, and Doc writes in his story, I, he's, he's not uh, always uh, politically correct. He says the husband, very meek, sits in the corner. So Doc starts recounting the story. He talks about being kept up at his grandmother's cottage, his father sleeping over at the hospital losing his varsity teammates. He talks about the soup and he talks about this young girl and the mother. And after a long pause, we'll do it. And it's the husband uh, who has agreed to the vaccination. And Doc, who I failed to mention, is my father-in-law now of 34 years, um, pens or finishes off that story uh, with I won and an exclamation mark. And I, I like to tell this story not only because it's certainly relevant in today's society, but it also emphasizes, I think, the spectrum and the balance of the art and science of medicine. Not only the experience and the care of a physician, but also the science on which we, which we base our decisions. And Doc, although he was truly a, a family physician and clinical physician, really utilized science in all he did. And, and I would say that, that he embodies a physician scientist. So I'm going to move on um, to the year 1988. And that is the year that uh, I fell in love with uh, this specialty of nephrology. And I know at Mount Sinai, you have a phenomenal division of nephrology that is now named after Barbara T. Murphy. Um, so for any residents or uh, trainees who have not decided what they want to do, I would say really think about the kidney. It's an incredible specialty. Um, but when I joined nephrology and I uh, chose it, selected it as an intern, um, at that point, I'd never had any research training um, at all. And I met an incredible mentor along the way, uh, Dr. Mitch Halperin, who was a physiologist in the Division of Nephrology uh, at St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto, really known as an acid base and electrolyte guru. And this was one of the very first research projects that I participated in. And if you notice, um, it, it was spurred on by a question at the bedside. It was spurred on by um, hyperkalemia uh, that we were seeing in patients treated with CNIs or cyclosporin, a calcineurin inhibitor in patients receiving a kidney transplant. And as you'll notice in this abstract, there were a number of normal subjects who took bicarbonate, they took methionine. Um, what is not stated overtly is those normal subjects were the residents and the trainees uh, at St. Mike's, uh, probably never passed an IRB. Um, but we were the ones who were doing uh, these studies. But the most important uh, piece that I learned uh, throughout this from um, Dr. Halperin and mentors along the way was to never accept sort of the, what had been written in textbooks um, as, as being the be all and end all. And there's always more to learn from individual cases. And I think, um, the, the role and the life of a physician scientist, um, bringing questions from the bedside is one of the most um, enjoyable things that we do. So Dr. Halpern also convinced me that in order uh, to really um, pursue medicine, um, that I needed to go away and, and train. And at this point, after completing my clinical fellowship without having any um, basic science training. I picked up my young daughter at the time and my husband and we moved to New Haven where I learned some molecular biology and learned um, about um, mouse genetics. 
And I'd like to share the next vignette, um, but base it again around a case and how some of these uh, newer tools that, that I learned along training helped us to unravel um, this case. So the story begins, again, it's a, a case that I saw a number of years ago when I was still in Toronto, a 26 year old female who had been completely healthy until September when she presented with some relatively non-specific symptoms, a low-grade fever, she had a recurrent rash, which was described as urticaria-like, she had some muscle aches, and her symptoms improved with oral prednisone. She was being seen at an outside hospital, a community hospital. Her symptoms relapsed when the dose was tapered, and in January of the following year, she was readmitted to the community hospital she now had a sore throat, some pleuritic chest pain, some abdominal pain, and an exploratory laparotomy was done, which was negative for any pathology, and she was discharged home. A few days later, she uh, had some painless vision loss in her left eye, and she was diagnosed by a community ophthalmologist with central retinal vein occlusion. About a week later, she was readmitted and she was seen by rheumatology in the community hospital who diagnosed pericarditis. They suspected adult onset Stills disease. And again, she was started on oral prednisone. Her laboratory values at that time just showed an elevated white blood cell count. Her creatinine was relatively normal. A urinalysis had been performed and the dip was negative and the microscopy was also negative and all of her other laboratory values which were extensively investigated were normal all of her serology for rheumatologic workup was negative and she underwent an extensive infectious disease workup which was also negative a couple of weeks later she presented to her primary care physician complaining of shortness of breath her creatinine now and her laboratory values were very abnormal with an elevated creatinine and her urinalysis now was also very abnormal with lots of protein, red blood cells. She had some granular casts, no cellular casts, elevated LDH, a low platelet count, her hemoglobin was low and she had red blood cell fragments that were seen on the blood film. Her complement uh, C3 level was now low. She underwent an MRI which showed non-specific changes and she was transferred down now to our hospital, a tertiary teaching care hospital, um, and admitted to the intensive care unit. She was seen by us uh, for the first time. She was intubated and urgent dialysis and plasmapheresis was initiated. And of course, by the time we saw her, which is often true when patients are transferred to a tertiary or quaternary care hospital, her diagnosis on transfer was pretty obvious. She clearly had a thrombotic microangiopathy. And I think everybody listening in knows that the TMAs or thrombotic microangiopathies are a heterogeneous group of disorders that are characterized by a triad with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, characterized by fragments or schistocytes shown by the arrows here on a blood smear thrombocytopenia and variable organ injury, which is caused by thrombi in the capillaries and the arterioles. And nephrologists often get involved because the glomerular microvasculature is particularly susceptible to this form of injury. And on the bottom, I show you um, just a, a glomerulus here with a, a clot in the arteriole, but also notice all these blood clots uh, within the capillary loops within within the glomerulus. And indeed, thrombotic microangiopathies may be renal restricted and not have all of the systemic features. So how can we put this young woman's story together? Well, when I think about thrombotic microangiopathies, I like to have a very simple um, classification scheme. There are a few out there, but I like to think about them in group, in a, in a categorize in three major groups. TTP or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, the hemolytic uremic syndromes, and then the other thrombotic microangiopathies, which we know can be caused by a variety of different uh, clinical conditions that I'm sure many of you have seen in, in consults on your wards. 
And underneath the hemolytic uremic syndromes, we also classify them as either the typical or associated with diarrhea or shigatoxin, atypical hemolytic uremic syndromes. And again, as I mentioned, under the other TMAs, there are many things, including infectious diseases, including rejection, uh, drugs, uh, pregnancy-related TMAs, and malignant hypertension. And you know, when I first entered uh, medicine and first entered nephrology, this was a paper from one of the leaders uh, in thrombotic microangiopathies and renal involvement. And at that time, we actually, um, it was actually believed that TTP and hemolytic uremic syndrome were part of the same spectrum. However, um, a number of discoveries over the following years, largely made by physician scientists, really um, enabled us to be able to separate these to um, very precisely manage these uh, individuals and actually improve patient outcomes. So when we think about TTP, we now know that that is associated with very low enzymatic activity of Adams TS13. And um, this, this enzyme had not been identified when I was training. Um, but was identified subsequently. And we now know that there is an injury to the endothelial cells, which could be a triggering factor, infection, radiation, or some other injury. And endothelial cells will release von Willebrand factor from Weibel Pilate bodies. And these von Willebrand factors can exist in large multimers, but you and I have an enzyme, Adams TS13, that chops it up. When there are larger von Willebrand factor multimers, this traps the platelets and results in thrombi. And it was a physician scientist, Moak, who in 1986, before we knew about Adams TS13, had actually identified these large multimers of von Willebrand factor and published it. And then David Ginsburg, another physician scientist, actually identified the Adams TS13 gene in patients who had congenital forms of TTP, also known as Upshaw-Schulman syndrome. And we know that TTP, um, certainly when I was training, it um, has classically been identified as a pentad, which was originally described in 1925 with the triad of TMAs, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, uh, and variable organ injury, including the kidney, but also neurologic involvement and fever. And when we think about hemolytic uremic syndrome originally, it was thought that it was much more uh, a, a dominant within uh, the glomerulus or within the kidney. And this image, which is taken from a, a much later review from uh, Dr. Beppe Ramutse, um, shows what we see on a biopsy. And if you look at the blue image of the glomerulus, um, it's meant to show a bloodless glomerulus that is completely filled up the capillary loops with these swollen endothelial cells, which you can see in gray down below, which is known as endotheliosis. And this is um, this, this endotheliosis is um, pathognomonic of all TMAs. And um, as far as hemolytic uremic syndromes, as I mentioned at the outset, this is really broken into two subgroups, which we now call typical or diarrhea associated, again, to be associated with shigatoxin producing um, bacteria. And it was a pediatric nephrologist in Toronto who originally identified the 0157 strain in a group of children who had um, visited a farm and had unpasteurized um, apple juice. Um, and the idea is that sugar toxin enters the systemic circulation and that children are more uh, susceptible because their glomerular endothelial cells express higher levels of a receptor known as GB3 to which the sugar toxin binds and results in endothelial cell injury. The atypical, uh, and just to mention um, that we learned quite a bit about um, hemolytic uremic syndrome, you may or may not remember this very large outbreak in 2011, which occurred in Germany, where there were almost 4,000 people affected with 1,000 cases of full-blown hemolytic uremic syndrome. And what was unusual about this 
outbreak was it it didn't affect children uh, as much as um, women with a median age of 42. Females were affected more than males. And when they identified uh, the bacteria, it turned out not to be the 0157, but it was another bacteria which can bind to the gut epithelium very tightly, but it had gained the sugar toxin um, gene. So it was a super um, bug or super virulent. And uh, at the time, there was a bit of an international incident because it was believed that it was due to Spanish cucumbers. Um, they were dumped uh, by Germany, um, but in, in the end, it turned out to be bean sprouts that had been grown in a factory in Germany, and it helped to explain the epidemiology. And what we learned uh, from this outbreak was that um, even though we often thought of TTP as having much more neurologic involvement because these were older individuals and neurologic testing was easier, there was a very high degree of neurologic involvement uh, in this condition as well. And moving on to the atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, this has been where there have been great advances over the past decade and a half. And by definition, it's not caused by sugar toxin. It tends to have a worse um, outcome with mortality, um, higher in end-stage renal disease, um, documented as higher. And the big breakthrough in recent years has been the identification of abnormalities in the complement regulatory system causing or being related uh, to triggering atypical HUS. And just to remind you about the complement system, it is uh, relatively confusing, but it is part of our innate immune system. And there are three arms to the uh, complement system, and they all funnel down through a final common pathway in the membrane attack complex. And you'll remember, certainly from medical school or undergraduate, that the classical pathway is the one we often think of in autoimmune diseases, which is triggered by uh, immune complexes. The lectin pathway protects us against microbial carbohydrates, but the alternative pathway, which is the one that is involved in a typical hemolytic uremic syndrome, is ticking over all the time in you and me, even as we sit here uh, this morning, and it helps to keep the endothelial cells clear. But you can imagine if the system is ticking over all the time, there has to be checks and balances. And there are a number of proteins, without going into details, shown in different colors here, that keep this alternate complement pathway in check. So on the upper panel on the endothelial cells with complement forever being ticked over on the endothelial cells, there are regulatory proteins that um, deactivate them. And what has been uh, discovered over the past decade and a half are mutations or autoantibodies to a number of these regulatory proteins. And I've listed them on the right hand side and there are now genetic panels and there are tests in the laboratory that we can do to identify mutations or to identify autoantibodies. And the idea is when you have uh, a decrease in the activity of one of these factors, uh, you get amplification of complement activation on the endothelial cells that upregulates selectins, which recruits neutrophils and results in thrombi. But one of the questions that has always remained with atypical HUS is that you might have two patients, even siblings, who carry the same genetic mutation in one of these regulatory proteins. And one individual will have recurrent or re relapsing episodes of atypical HUS, and the other does not. And the idea, or at least the um, current working hypothesis, is that you need to have two hits, that there needs to be another trigger. So, so far, what I've told you is um, we've reviewed thrombotic microangiopathy, broken it down into three large groups with TTP being characterized by extremely low Adams TS13 activity. It may be due to a mutation, which is rare and, and presents in the pediatric time period, or much more commonly, it's an acquired autoantibody. But we can measure this Adams TS13 in the laboratory, and you can make a diagnosis now of TTP. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, we've discussed the typical or shiga toxin associated, which tends to uh, 
affect pediatric population more commonly, um, and also the complement regulatory proteins. I did not discuss some of the other causes of hemolytic uremic syndromes, including uh, streptococcus pneumonia, having cobalamin deficiency, which damages the endothelium. And now over the past few years, there's been another, a, a, another group of genes that are not related to the complement system as rarer causes of atypical H2S, but again, are available for measurement on genetic panels. So you can make those diagnoses in patients. What I'd like to do for the remaining time is to focus on one subtype uh, within this other group, this heterogeneous group of other TMAs, and it has to do with a vascular protective and vascular growth factor known as VEGF. And the reason uh, I'm going to focus on this is because it's helped us uh, to understand not only something about why um, it, it has helped us really to understand why the kidney or the glomerulus is particularly susceptible to thrombotic injury. And this story um, began um, sort of beyond uh, in, in the laboratory with a little bit of uh, serendipity, which often happens, I think, along the way as well in science. So to remind all of you um, about the glomerulus, um, it is, this is a schematic diagram of a portion of a glomerulus. And you'll remember you've got about a million in each of your kidneys. And the glomerular barrier itself is composed of just uh, two cell types. Shown in blue is the podocyte. And shown uh, here below is the healthy fenestrated, very flattened glomerular endothelium separated by an intervening glomerular basement membrane. And um, within your million or so glomeruli, the, um, this is a very specialized microvascular bed. It's perm selective, allowing water and small solutes to pass freely into the urine, but preventing the loss of large macromolecules like albumin. And it's also under incredible stress all the time. As you imagine, you're making on the order of 180 liters of primary urinary filtrate each day. So the podocytes, when you look at them in, in, uh, on a electron micrograph, um, you can see it's got a very unique architecture with a cell body and a number of the nephrologists there at Mount Sinai are true experts in this cell type. Um, it has microtubular based primary processes and then secondary based um, actin based foot processes and they wrap around the underlying glomerular endothelial cells, which if you're standing in the blood space, you can see these fenestrations and uh, the flattened nature of this um, endothelium. And if we look in cross-section, the podocytes and the glomerular endothelial cells, and we know that urinary filtrate is passing into the urinary space. Well, it turns out that podocytes make a number of factors that are critically important to keep the glomerular endothelial cells healthy. And one of those factors um, is a vascular growth factor known as VEGFA, often touted as the master angiogenic factor because you need VEGFA during development to make any of your blood vessels. And uh, what's interesting about VEGFA and what one of my neighbors in Toronto, a scientist, Dr. Andres Naj, uh, alerted me to is that podocytes make more VEGFA than any other cell type in the body. And even in the adult glomerulus, um, as we're sitting here right now, these podocytes are still making VEGF, whereas many other blood uh, vascular beds switch it off following development. And the receptors are expressed um, largely by the glomerular endothelial cells. So we had a hypothesis at, at this point after Andres told me about this, and, and we speculated that VEGF was playing a major role in protecting the glomerular microvasculature. And this is where we were able to utilize some of the tools in the mouse genetics that I had learned um, as a postdoc. And um, this is just an image of the same mouse with the lights off. It's expressing sea anemone protein. Just to make the point that we have incredible tools to manipulate the mouse genome to answer specific biologic, physiologic, 
or questions that we bring from the bedside. So the study that, that we performed um, initially was to remove VEGF just from the podocytes in the developing kidney. And the reason that we needed to do this model is if you make a general knockout of VEGF-A, even if you reduce it by 50%, it's not compatible with embryonic life because VEGF is so critical for formation and growth of blood vessels during development. And when we remove VEGF-A from the podocytes, we actually did what's known as an allelic series. So we dialed the dose down to zero or we overexpressed VEGF-A and what we noticed no matter how we tweaked the dose of VEGF-A, we saw a very severe glomerular phenotype, almost a textbook of renal pathology. But I want to focus just on this middle uh, image here, which is endotheliosis. And as I mentioned at the outset, when I showed you the images of hemolytic uremic syndrome, endotheliosis is pathognomonic of thrombotic microangiopathy. And this was actually the first inkling to us that VEGF might be protecting the glomerulus against thrombotic microangiopathy. And around the same time in the clinic, there was an introduction of this new class of agents that were targeting VEGF signaling, developed originally by Genentech, Bevacizumab, which were anti-VEGF antibodies to the VEGF ligand, with the goal to use these new treatments to shut down blood vessel growth in tumors. Um, recognizing that VEGF, as discovered by Judah Folkman, was the growth factor, one of the major growth factors for vascular growth in tumors. And there were a number of drug companies that developed a number of different agents, either against the ligand or against the VEGF receptors, and you will all have seen them uh, in patients um, being used at some point, including the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that block the VEGF receptors. And originally, when these drugs came out, when the preclinical studies were done uh, by Genentech, it, it was thought that they would be very safe in adults and there would be very few adverse effects. And that VEGF really was important in tumor growth and development, but really didn't play much of a role in vascular, quiescent vascular beds. Um, however, we know that when they actually made it out into patients, we started to see adverse effects. And from the renal perspective, the incidence of proteinuria was very high, and including uh, nephrotic syndrome uh, to a lesser degree, but um, it was dose dependent. The higher the dose of the anti-VEGF agent, the more proteinuria and the more likely the patient was to have proteinuria. In addition, the patients also were developing uh, hypertension. Um, and then there started to be single case reports coming out of um, single case reports coming out of thrombotic microangiopathy with endotheliosis. So at this point, with our mouse model, with these cases coming out, I reached out to our renal pathologists and renal pathologists around the country, and we gathered together a small case series of six patients, all of whom had received bevacizumab and all of whom had developed some degree of kidney injury um, and had undergone a kidney biopsy based on the nephrologist's uh, recommendation. And this image just shows you one of, the, um, one of the renal biopsies, but we saw it in all of the patients. Uh, the black outlines the glomerular basement membrane. And again, what you can see is uh, completely bloodless capillary loops. This was a rip-roaring thrombotic microangiopathy with swollen endothelial cells. Uh, and red blood cell fragments. So to summarize these patients, it was only six patients, but there was an association with an anti-VEGF agent with a thrombotic microangiopathy. The majority were renal restricted, but one of the patients actually had a systemic evidence um, of a thrombotic microangiopathy with the full-blown triad. So at that point, our hypothesis was that these VEGF inhibitors were causing proteinuria and glomerular injury by a local reduction of VEGF. Um, my colleagues who are adult nephrologists um, appreciated the hypothesis, but the question always remained, your mouse model took VEGF-A out during kidney development, and that's really not relevant to a filtering adult glomerulus where urine is flowing back against 
how VEGF would have to get to the glomerular endothelial cells. So we um, did an uh, additional set of um, proof of principle studies where we were able to develop a new transgenic system. It took a number of years, but a mouse carrying four different transgenes um, with the ability when we give the mouse a doxycycline derivative, it actually combines with one of the transgene products to activate an enzyme that could knock out VEGFA just from the podocytes in an adult filtering glomerulus. So we could take a cage of perfectly healthy adult mice, add doxycycline to the drinking water, knock out VEGFA. And in these adult mice, 100% of them developed a thrombotic microangiopathy with blood clots in their cap capillary loops as shown by the arrow. And they had very severe endotheliosis, as you can see these swollen endothelial cells compared to these flattened fenestrated endothelial cells. And this looked exactly like our patients um, who we had biopsied and seen endotheliosis. So this uh, just summarizes our proof of principle studies. 100% of the mice developed glomerular injury that was characteristic of TMA. It really helped to support uh, that VEGF produced by the podocytes is required by the glomerular endothelium, even in a filtering glomerulus. And TMA observed in patients on VEGF inhibitors, we believed was an on-target effect and due to local reduction of VEGF. And this is just a, a visual model where we think podocytes are making VEGF that's critically important to travel back and activate these VEGF receptors. And in patients, susceptible patients receiving the VEGF inhibitors, this results in endotheliosis and TMA that can be completely recapitulated in our knockout model. Um, I didn't go into or have time to talk about preeclampsia, but beautiful work from Ananth Karamanchi and others in Boston demonstrated that from the placenta, when there is a decoy receptor or an endogenous anti-VEGF agent produced known as soluble FLT1, you see exactly the same effects um, in, in the glomerulus, suggesting that this is the mechanism leading to TMA in pregnancy-associated um, glomerular endothelial injury. So one other final um, paper I wanted to draw your attention to was published, and it was um, published in a patient who had received an anti-VEGF agent, not systemically for tumors, and you probably all know that the anti-VEGF agents really uh, now have found their space in treating vascular eye diseases where their standard of care for a proliferative form of diabetic um, eye disease as well as wet form of macular degeneration. And this was a case of an individual who developed thrombotic microangiopathy and kidney failure after four intravitreal injections. The patient uh, was tested for deficiency of Adams TS13 for other complement regulatory deficiencies and was not found to have any. The uh, anti-VEGF injections into the eye were stopped and the patient recovered. And there have now been additional case series, uh, again, a small subset of patients receiving these injections who have gone on to develop kidney failure or thrombotic microangiopathy in the kidney following intravitreal anti-VEGF agents. So I want to return uh, to our 26-year-old girl, uh, woman now, and the, the case that I presented at the beginning. If you recall in her case history, uh, early on in January, she had developed painless vision loss and had suspected central retinal vein occlusion. The treatment for central retinal vein occlusion is intravitreal injection of anti-VEGF agents, and she had received those as an outpatient. Uh, when we received the fundoscopic images, um, it was clear that it wasn't really a central retinal vein occlusion, but really an ophthalmolitis that she had had. And we questioned, you know, why would she be susceptible if this really was a trigger? We know that millions of individuals are getting intravitreal injections. So again, we thought back to the two hit hypothesis. Today, I've told you about three protective regulatory pathways that are important. The ADAMTS TS13, complement regulatory proteins, and VEGF receptor signaling. 
Um, this young woman had an active disease. She had Stills, Stills disease with some complement activation. And although her C3 was initially within the normal range, it became low when she was transferred to our hospital during her full-blown TMA. So we sent her blood for genetic sequencing uh, to Dr. Christoph uh, Licht, an expert in complement at the Hospital for Sick Children, and identified an activating mutation in C3 one of the uh, mutations that has been linked to atypical HUS. And again, this young woman had walked around her entire um, life with this activating mutation. Uh, and we speculate that having the second hit or the trigger with the uh, intravitreal anti-VEGF agent was one of the potential explanations in her case. So um, how this young woman was managed, she originally was treated with plasmapheresis in exchange and her uh, platelets and hemoglobin normalized. She was discharged home from our hospital on outpatient hemodialysis, but presented with a relapse fairly um, quickly with fragments, hemolysis and posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. At that point, we had her uh, genetic mutation back. And in Canada at that time, you could not get eculizumab without having a genetic mutation in hand. She received eculizumab, which shuts down the common final pathway. It's a, um, an antibody to C5A, um, and she um, recovered remarkably well. So I'm just going to finish up um, and sort of uh, reflect on the treatment advances for TMA from the time I began my training when we thought TTP and HUS were part of the same uh, disorder. We now know that TTP is defined by an extremely low Adams TS13, and this really does uh, direct how we manage these patients where we want to replace Adams TS13, which is why plasmapheresis uh, an exchange and plasma infusion is so important if you suspect this, this um, disorder to, to save um, individuals' lives. Also, in recent years, caplizizumab, which disrupts the interaction between von Willebrand factor, those large multimers and platelets, is now available. A typical HUS, um, again, we've got genetic panels, and that can help to direct uh, how we manage these patients anti-VEGF um, agents, we can now suspect it as we do for other um, drugs that might be linked to TMA, and we can use our clinical judgment um, if it's deemed important to stop that therapy. I didn't talk about preeclampsia, but again, with the understanding that the VEGF signaling pathway and soluble FLITs involved has led to new treatments. I'm not going to share um, where we're going uh, with this, but just to, to name an incredibly talented medical student who has taken uh, these mice now and has revisited uh, in, in the era of single cell RNA-seq and Dorian Kaminsky, uh, who's going to be applying for internal medicine spots next year, um, has already started to identify some novel um, findings in, in some of these kidneys and with the ultimate goal to really understand what endotheliosis is and ultimately to identify some uh, novel biomarkers. So in the final two slides, um, my topic was from potassium to podocytes to policy. And it's certainly something I never thought I would be involved with um, in my career when I started out. But working at the American Society of Nephrology very closely with Barbara Murphy, um, I've become incredibly impressed um, by the power um, of physicians and scientists when they get involved in pushing for policy. And this is just an image where Barbara and I were both um, able to participate in the signing of the Advancing American Kidney Health. Um, an executive order, which the picture doesn't tell the whole story because it was 10 years of chipping away on the hill by incredibly dedicated staff, multiple societies, patient groups, um, as well as volunteers. And no surprise that um, Barbara, in addition to everything else she did, was absolutely exceptional uh, in advocating for policy. And um, I pop this slide up um, at the end. Not only was she 
uh, responsible, largely responsible for changing policy so that HIV infected patients could receive kidney transplants. But as recently as last year, the passing of the immuno bill for which Barbara um, played an instrumental role ensuring that patients who have kidney transplants would continue to have coverage for their life-saving immunosuppression drugs. So in closing, what I hope to do today, um, and I realize I, I talked a lot, um, but was really to show uh, the amazing twists and turns um, and paths that one might take as a physician scientist. Um, and I think um, there is no better role model to aspire to than Barbara Murphy, a trailblazer uh, whose legacy in scholarship, in improving patient care, uh, in policy, um, in leadership, in academic medicine, and also all the mentors she has left behind, and was always able to do that uh, while bringing joy to those around her. So again, incredible a privilege uh, to be with you here today. And um, I'm going to end with the final picture. Um, again, a privilege of all the incredible uh, trainees and other individuals I've had the opportunity to work with in my own career. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. So I think we have a few minutes for the question. I saw Ben, you have a question? Ben. Dr. Chan, the vice chair of the research in the department of medicine. Okay. You have to unmute it. Ben. You cannot unmute? He can't unmute, you have to put it in the chat, Ben. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Why cannot I unmute? That's a... We don't let everybody unmute because the, the chaos that would ensue. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we're getting a lot of comments about yeah, it. Yeah, that's a comment. Yeah. Yeah. And, exceptional yeah. lecture. They really like the lecture. Yeah. So, yeah. A great testament to Barbara. That's very true. Yeah. So I think uh, Ben's typing the question, and uh, yeah, it's all okay. So okay, uh, and I uh, <laughs> sure. Do you want me, John? Uh, I can read that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So thanks for the question. The state of genetic profiling for use of VEGF inhibitors, and so there isn't any at at this point. I think it, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think. Currently, as I as I mentioned, we you know there are millions and millions of individuals who are given intravitreal injections of anti VEGF agents. There are some signals in diabetic patients um, where we might see a more rapid loss of GFR. I think it would be interesting to do that study. It would first need to you know be at the research level, and that would certainly be doable. Um, you know, to see if there are uh, any signals between someone walking around with a variant. So even some of the variants in complement regulatory genes may be less, um, you know, may just give some small increased risk. So I think it's a terrific question. And <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. That's, okay, I think that's the noise. Yeah, let me see if I can mute everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sue, maybe I, I start a question. So, I think it's a, now it's very, really challenging, to, you know, to get physician scientists or training the physician scientists. Many residents or fellows, they, you know, don't want to become the physician scientist. So, as the, you know, president of the ASN and the division chiefs, what we can do to help uh, the yeah. young, you know, physician to become the chair. The, the yeah. Side. yeah, yeah, that's a fantastic question, John. And um, you know, I think, um, and and what I I tried to demonstrate that I think even you know my father-in-law, who was not a lab scientist, I mean, he really brought science to his practice. Um, but for the traditional physician scientist, I think you know one of the issues clearly, and I think this then has to become at an institution level as well as at. ASN 
um, and other places where we protect time. So, you know, and, and I know you've done a phenomenal job of mentoring physician scientists in your own division. I know Barbara did an incredible job. Um, I think um, from our uh, perspective, um, you know, we need to be able to advocate for or resources or creative ways in order to provide that protected time for individuals to pursue, you know, what they want to do. But what I would say to trainees, you know, who are thinking about it or maybe have absolutely no experience, you know, myself, I had zero experience in doing any research until I completed my clinical fellowship training. And um, I recognize that's you know, unusual maybe for today, but um, I would say take advantage of, you know, things that are around you, reach out to people. Um, one of the things I know, John, you feel the same way as, as I do. I love getting cold calls or people emailing me from undergrad or medical school or residency and will do whatever I can to, you know, um, either bring them into my own group or to, you know, connect them with somebody who might fit their passions and their, um, you know, what they're really interested in. So it's a big question you've asked, but I, I'm still very optimistic. And I would say what an incredible, incredible um, career and opportunities and different things you get to do, um, you know, along the way. Thank you. So, yeah. And yeah, exactly. ahead, if missing for time, we, we have to come to a close, Dr. Gregan, but this was excellent. It was terrific to have you. I know that you and Barbara were very good friends professionally, and it's great to have you as our inaugural uh, speaker in the Dr. Barbara T. Murphy uh, lecture series. So thank you very much, and feel free next year to come back and join us uh, as a participant, too. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Thank Thomas, you. and thank you, <laughs> Dr. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Have Thank a nice you. day, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.